Welcome to Dear Sandy. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly, representing parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And today we're going to be talking about the Guiding Eyes for the Blind and what a wonderful organization it is. And we have, as my special guest, Kathy Zubricki. And Kathy, you're the Vice President of the Training Programs at the Guiding Eyes for the Blind. That's right. And of course, you're in Yorktown. Yes. Is it is it Yorktown address? Yep. And uh, so happy. And then we have an additional person here, uh, um, Drifter. And Drifter has, I, we think, has kind of drifted off to sleep, but the eyes just opened up. And heard his name. Yes, yes, yes. And tell us a little bit oh. about Drifter. Well, Drifter is about 18 months of age. He is in training. Uh, he's about three quarters of the way through his guide dog training, so he's ready to be placed within the next couple of months with a blind or visually impaired handler. Right, so right now he's um, around getting getting right. some good advice. And getting some good training experiences. We train um, all over. We, we start our training in Yorktown, very quiet environments, and then as the dog becomes more and more adjusted to um, the environment and to what we're asking of the dog, then we move on to more complicated environments. So you'll see us training here in Peekskill. We train in um, Mount Kisco, we go to Manhattan. So we try to uh, um, expose the dogs to everything they may be exposed to when they're matched with a blind or visually impaired mm -hmm. handler. I have been up here, we're in a studio in Peekskill uh, now, and I, and I have, when I come up, I have often seen mm -hmm. uh, people right outside um, the studio uh, with, with the dogs and, and I guess the, um, the individuals that are gonna have these as, as their dogs, but also then the trainers alongside. Right. right. And you're trying to get everybody to be able to cross streets and all of that kind of thing? Yeah, um, well, yeah, the dog is responsible for keeping a person safe, right? So they have mm -hmm. to learn how to stop at changes of elevation. So that's a curb or a step. Mm -hmm. They have to learn how to avoid obstacles, and we call them stationary, which would be like a mailbox or a, a light pole, or moving obstacles, mainly pedestrians and bicyclists. So um, they have to learn to navigate traffic, how to get on and off escalators, how to navigate a subway. So there's an awful lot that goes into the training experience before the dog is placed with a blind handler. Mm -hmm. So the, the people that we see are, I'm sure there's a trainer here as well, as, as the person that's going to mm -hmm. be working the dog. Right. And is that to, that's to check to be sure everything is working well. Everybody's getting trained at the same time, I guess. In, well, in no, the, the dogs, they actually start their training um, four or five months before um, they're matched with a client. So we have typically teams of instructors who work together. They're either teams of two or three, mm -hmm. and they will start any, begin training anywhere between eight to 10 dogs. Uh, for a four or five month period. At the end of that training period, that's when we will bring the, our students in to be matched with the dogs and then they begin the training process of learning how to communicate with the dog the same way the instructor did and how to learn mm -hmm. how to work with the dog and how to live with the dog and how to understand what the dog is trying to tell them. That process takes about three weeks. Mm. Well, let's go back kind of to the beginning. Um, how many you're in Westchester County. Are, are you providing uh, dogs for people that live all over this area, beyond, or right. you know, what, is, what is your catchment area, so to speak? Yeah, we provide guide dog training for people all over the U.S., so from East oh. Coast, West Coast, um, um, also Canada. So we do have a large, well, we have about 100, we have about 1,000 graduates actively working in the United States. Of that group, we have 150 in New York State, 55 are in New York City, and 16 are actually in Westchester. Oh my goodness, yeah. okay. Are there other guiding eyes for the blind other places around the country? There are other guide dog schools around the country. We're not affiliated with each other, but there mm -hmm, are about mm -hmm. 10 to 12 guide dog schools throughout the U.S. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's a lot of people that you're, you're serving. So how do you find out, um, I mean, how, how does somebody know about you? Right. Uh, often somebody will learn about us through a friend who has a guide dog. Um, they may learn about us through their orientation and mobility specialist, and those are the people that teach blind and visually impaired people how to navigate the environment with a cane. 
which they need to know before they come to us for a guide dog. They need to know how to travel um, in an environment, how to listen for traffic, how to know how to cross the street, how to map out a route, how to correct an error. So they will learn that before they come to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They also may learn about us through conferences in which we um, will be there to talk with people who are interested in getting a guide dog. So there's a variety of ways they may find out about mm -hmm. us. Also on the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I know people that have been moms and dads to wonderful animals like, mm, like yes. Drifter. Yeah. Um, so you have to have, you have to plan, you, you have a certain number of clients, you have to plan that you're going to have, once, once you've decided that they're going to have a, a, a dog mm -hmm. with them, you have to figure out how many dogs you need and what else in the field. Do you, do you have to think about all this and we be have prepared? To think all, we have to think about all that and more, right? right okay. So um, once the, we're actually thinking about dogs that we are placing today were actually bred two years ago. So we're always thinking two years ahead, right? So we have our own breeding center in Patterson and that's where all the puppies are born. And from that point on, about eight weeks, they're um, placed in a, a puppy raiser's home. And for about 14 to 15, maybe 16 months, the puppy raisers will teach them everything they need to know about being good mm -hmm. in the house, good house manners, um, how to be social, how to be, how to greet people, all the skills a, a guide dog, dog will need to know before they come in for their formal training. Now, who are, are these um, people that are all over the country too? That, are, or is it mostly in this area? Would you say? No, that are we have close to 500 puppy raisers. Uh -huh. And so we have puppy raisers and puppy raiser regions from Maine to North Carolina and oh, wow. also as far west as Ohio. And all those puppy raisers are overseen by a remote group of people, um, regional managers. So these are staff members of Guiding Eyes who visit the puppy raisers, who help them through those kind of difficult times when the puppy is getting up so early in the morning or they, um, they have a sick puppy, something like that. Mm -hmm, they also mm -hmm. teach them you know, what the skills the uh, puppy, the puppies need to know. So they oversee all our puppy raisers. So they're starting, as a puppy raiser, you're starting with them really as a puppy. Yeah, brand new Really puppy. brand new, it's like a right. brand new baby. Exactly, right. Right, right. and you right. have to go through all those skills. So do, what kind of training do you give the puppy raisers? Not, not a lot, they just- Oh no, we give them a lot. What, okay. We give them a lot of support, a lot of training, because we know, we know the skills that the dogs need to know to come in to, for training to be successful. So they have a lot of um, support. And we have a specific program called the, a step program that the puppy raisers um, will follow in order to help the dog reach its potential. That's terrific, yeah. that's terrific. So what happens at the end, let's see, two, about two years old? A um, little younger than the, that, 16 months, maybe 18 months, yeah. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden they get to that age and here you are the puppy raiser and you've just grown so attached absolutely <laughs> to this the wonderful puppy or not a puppy anymore right. but maybe acting like a puppy um i guess that's a very difficult time for people or or uh, do some of them just kind of regret that they went into this program because they have to give the dog away or do they all really bond with what they're trying to do oh i think they they really connect with what they're trying to do and the mission of the gui of guiding eyes which is to um uh, enhance greater independence and mobility for blind and f visually impaired people. And yeah, it's the hardest job. It mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. is the hardest job to do, but we do have puppy raisers who have raised, well, Drifter was raised by someone who's raised 30 puppies for us. Oh, so we, wow. have, um, we have a significant number of people who will raise two, three, or more dogs. We have a, about mm -hmm. 65 to 75 percent repeat raised of raisers, and I think that speaks to the amount of support that we're actually able to give the mm -hmm, dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, when the dog graduates, graduates with their visually impaired handler, the puppy raiser is invited back oh, to okay. meet the person the dog is going uh -huh. is now going to be sharing their life with, and to spend some time with the do puppy that well the dog now that they raised, right. and uh, the graduate. And quite often, the graduate and the puppy raiser will. Um, keep in contact with each other, send gifts and cards and you know updates on what uh -huh. they're doing with the dogs and things like that. So it's a nice connection. Right, that is, that is mm. really wonderful. Yep. And when you think about doing that, raising a puppy and having it be used as, as, 
as the eyes right. for the individual that's blind it has to be so, so special. It's impactful, right? right? When you can help somebody else and you don't even know who that person is, it's a very impactful experience. Right. So, And we rely on our puppy raisers. Um, and we are constantly looking for volunteers who would like to raise a puppy. So mm -hmm. if anybody's mm -hmm. interested, they just have to visit our website. Right. Yeah. Uh, I know we, we were putting up the website right. and the phone number so people can contact you right. in, in your town. So, um, well, uh, you know, sometimes a puppy, somebody has a puppy, mm -hmm. and they've been raising it because I have, um, I, my, my daughter has a right. puppy that was raised by Guiding Eyes for the Blind, but, but the puppy just didn't quite, um, had some stomach issues right. and so on. So then you have an adoption program. Right. I don't know whether you call it that or not. But sure, we call it actually a release dog program. So not every um, dog that enters our training program is going to graduate. Um, and for those dogs that um, are not going to be guide dogs, we have actually other options for them, other career choices for them. Sometimes career choices, that, I love it. It's a career choice, and, the, <laughs> and the, actually the dog will tell us what career they want, right? Whether they want to be a guide dog or move on to something else. Uh -huh. So we have, uh, for some dogs, they go into detection, where they'll, they'll be actually doing um, accelerant work or drug work, that type of thing. Oh my goodness, yeah. maybe for the, um you know the for, for the police so, so that they're right. they're hired by right. police to become police dogs they can become police oh. dogs um, some dogs will go actually go to other service dog organizations so they may not have the qualities to be a guide dog or maybe not even the confidence to be a guide dog but they'd be a lovely service dog mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. a different type of individual so we have those career choices for them if that's not um, going to be in their wheelhouse, then we the puppy raiser has the first opportunity to adopt the dog back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are those three steps before the dog goes into what, what we would call public adoption. Mm -hmm. And we have a long waiting list of people who would oh, love I to. Oh, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. I don't know how long your daughter it waited. Was, it, it was a while. Yeah. It was a while. Yeah. And they were just thrilled, and it's a great dog. Right. Great Good. dog. It just had a nervous stomach, and I think right. that that probably just, you know, wasn't wasn't the right place. It's guide work is stressful and mm -hmm, so sometimes mm -hmm. dogs will exhibit that that stress by having that nervous stomach. Right. But once you move them out of that type of environment sometimes that does go mm -hmm. away. Did you say there are like a thousand um, active, graduates? active graduates? Yes. We have a thousand are, active graduates across the U.S. Right. Now does that include, that doesn't include the, the, the other career choice no. that somebody might have. No, so these, these are, are the active guide dogs. Guide dogs. Right. With That's people. correct. Yep. Right. So what does a person, you know, you see guide dogs and, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't uh, patted uh, Drifter here, but um, are we supposed to, when somebody's coming along or they're sitting in the living room mm -hmm. or whatever, and they have a guide dog, what are we supposed to do? Even if we love dogs and everything else, is there a responsibility on us Absolutely. to do something and special? I'm so, and I'm so glad you asked that because it's, it's, I think if you're a dog lover, it's somewhat human nature to want to reach out and, and um, pet a dog, particularly mm -hmm. a guide dog. And um, the best thing to do would be to ask the person first, may I, may I pet your dog? Um, mm -hmm. The dog may be, the, the team that you're seeing may be focusing on um, trying to assess whether or not it's safe enough to cross the street. And if, if somebody comes along and starts to pet the dog, the dog can be a little bit responsive, you know, may engage with the person um, a little bit, and that distracts the dog from the work. So it could place both the handler and themselves in a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, the, even when asked, the guide dog handler may say, no, thank you, dog is working. Mm -hmm. So, but it's always right. best to ask first. Right. Do people ever trade dogs? Does, does one dog do not as well with one person and might do better with somebody else? Um, well, is there once the dog is graduated, no, they don't typically trade. Uh, we, the dog, once the dog is matched with a blind person and they actually graduate and leave the school, it's certainly our goal that they stay together um, mm -hmm. and work together for many, many years. Now, the person may have a life-changing event or may have um, decided that, you know, they, they really no longer 
have a need for a guide dog, whatever their choice is. So if the dog is, um, they may contact us and say, you know, I really, I'm not going to be working Drifter much longer. And mm -hmm. so we would go out and pick the dog up and bring the dog back. If the dog is young enough, we Might would- Might be able to attach to somebody else. Exactly. Yep. Right. So if not, then the dog would, it, again, if there's not another career choice for the dog, the dog would be offered back to the puppy raiser. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the whole whole situation. You have you have a, a, a dog that's that's um, that you're being born, and you said in Putnam County, in the eastern side right. of Putnam County. What what is the cost of this whole gamut of, you know, going from uh, the the birth of a dog right. to all of this training and so on. Do you, do you have a dollar amount on that at all? About fifty thousand uh, dollars when you see a guide dog team and um, out and about. It's about a fifty thousand um, dollar from beginning from to beginning graduation. To end. Yeah, from beginning to end, and actually right. beyond graduation because we provide lifetime support. So if a graduate a graduate could be in California and is having some kind of difficulty. Uh -huh. Maybe they're having some working issues, something like that, that they can't resolve on their own. We will send somebody out there to work with them to keep the team together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we, we provide lifetime support. And That's while it's $50,000 when you see a guide dog and a team working together, um, we rely entirely on donations to make those teams um, work. Wow. So, there's no government funding. No government funding. No government funding, no. So it's entirely. Right. I didn't see you in the state budget, so. Not yes, this. No and you probably funding. won't, right? right. Yeah. So. Um, it's all um, up to people then to contribute. To support us, right. 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 And, and I think you also, do you have some volunteers that come to Yorktown um, just to help with sure. any part of administration oh. yes. or. Um, we have uh, a very large group of volunteers that work both at Yorktown and in our Patterson campus. And so, yes, they'll do clerical work. They might do kennel work. Uh, some of our volunteers um, will spend some time with the dogs who are in kennels, providing mm -hmm. enrichment, you know, just spending time with them. Um, enrichment is... Um just describe enrichment. A enrichment bit. is <laughs> enrichment time is taking a dog out and maybe taking a dog out for a nice walk uh -huh, if the dog's right. not being worked that day. It might involve taking the dog out into one of our big play yards and, and engage the dog with some toys and things like right, that just right. to kind of um, make the day go a little more pleasant for a dog. Right. So we have volunteers who do that. Um, and yeah, we have volunteers in both campuses. So. And how many, again, dogs do you have there pretty much at one time? Our, at our training yes. school? We have about 162 dogs there at any given time, and they would be all in different stages of training, from mm -hmm, beginning mm -hmm, to dogs mm -hmm, that are mm -hmm. close to being placed. So it's it's a big, big process. Right. Yeah. Is there any a time when somebody needs to have a dog that you just don't have anything available and have to recommend out, or you haven't gotten to that point? No, there's not really. I mean, if, if someone's interested in, in getting a guide dog, and what what helps us with our assessment of what a person needs in a guide dog is we have a, another remote group of people, field representatives, mm -hmm. who will travel to the, per, um, the applicant's home and do an in-home interview. So we can mm -hmm. get a really mm -hmm. good idea of what their expectations are. They can learn more about us. Um, we will actually take them on a uh, Juno walk, which means uh, the instructor is holding the handle and teaching the blind person basic um, harness skills and mm -hmm. get an idea of how they like to travel, how fast they like to walk, where they hope to work the guide dog. All those go in, all those components are very important when we begin the matching process. So once right. a person has applied for a dog, um, that application comes to committee and if we've accepted the person then we'll find a mm -hmm. dog for them. What kind of breeds do you have? Is it quite a number of them that are guide dogs or? No, we um, use primarily Labrador Retrievers like Drifter mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, also um, German Shepherds. So, and I've actually, I had the pleasure of being an assessor for the International Guide Dog Federation and in that role I got to travel to see various guide dog schools all over the world and globally you'll see mostly Labradors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I have to tell you, Drifter has been one of the best guests. He's very <laughs> quiet, right? <laughs> you can't argue with that. So what is, what is Drifter's day like usually besides lying on this wonderful carpet? Sure. Um, well, their day the, at 
the Yorktown campus, their days start in the kennels, so we open up the kennels at about 8 in the morning. All the dogs are allowed out while we do the, go through the cleaning process, and then they're mm -hmm. brought back in. They're either fed or they're taken in by their trainers to the various sites uh, to train for the day. So they're socialized as they're taken out. There's some socializing going on with um, other dogs, or is it? Oh, yeah, they're playtime. Yeah, they're, they're, playtime. There's playtime when they're let out right. first thing in the morning, and it can be a pretty raucous time. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so it's like a lot of kids in kindergarten, right, just being <laughs> right. let out. Um, and then their trainers will take them to their, ver as I said, their various locations. And we do a lot of our training in White Plains, so you may see us down there a lot. We have a, another yes, facility have down there, there where we do most of our training. At the end of the day, the dogs are brought back. They're allowed out one more time. They may be fed, depending on what their day was like, and then they, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're um, in for the evening. Right. Is there a certain type of feed that is used for guide dogs, or as opposed to other Certain dogs, type of uh, you know, food that they have is there uh, there's that's nothing special. Nothing special. You know, okay. No, uh, the type of food, food would be the kind of food, and, and again, we want to be able to provide uh, food that is easily accessible for a blind or visually impaired person, mm -hmm. and also that can fit within a budget. Mm -hmm. so. Right, right. So that's great, Kathy. How did you ever get into this business? Into did you? This? Yes. Did you ever think when you were no. in high school or? Well, Whatever it's, that you were going to be that's training a, that's dogs. That's a bit of a story. Oh, okay. So, All right. Um, I grew up in Morristown, New Jersey, which is the home of another guide dog yes, school, the I Seeing Eye, right? Right. So I was very familiar with watching the trainers, and I was fascinated. Mm -hmm. um, so I would see the trainers on a daily basis. I'd see them working with their dogs, working with their students, and, uh, you know, something in the back of my mind thought, well, that would be a great thing to do, right, working with dogs and people. Mm. And then I had the opportunity to meet Morris Frank, who was the first person in the U.S. ever to have a guide dog. And that was in, he got his first dog in 1928 in Beve, Switzerland. Ah. Oh, and then brought. So that was the first, first time. Yes. So started 20, 1929. And so yeah. I was working, he, Mr. Frank uh, maintained an insurance company in the same building that I was uh, doing part-time work in, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was so fascinated by this, and this is the mid-70s. So I, I went into, I had to deliver some mail, and I went into his office one day, and, and uh, I said, Mr. Frank, and at that time there were mostly men doing guide work, right? So I said, Mr. Frank, what do you think of women as guide dog trainers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with Mr. Frank, y y you never had to guess when he gave an answer. There was never any ambiguity. Right. I don't think they're going to be. They'd be any damn good. Oh, okay. And I so said, is that your challenge? It's. <laughs> and so I said, "Wow, well, that was a conversation stopper." But um, um, I decided I would go up to the seeing eye, and I applied, and I actually used Mr. Frank as a reference. Oh, okay. So okay. that's how I got started right. in right. guide work. Right. So it's been a, a number of years doing different things, I suppose. Yeah, I started as an instructor. And mm -hmm. then when I joined um, Guiding Eyes in 1987, again, I joined as an instructor. I became a class supervisor. Um, I joined the special needs program. Then that program provides dogs for people who have additional disabilities along with blindness. Mm -hmm. So I worked there quite, uh, for quite a while, became the director of that program, and then became the director of training and up to where I am now, vice president of training program. Mm -hmm. So I've been in the industry for 42 years. So, would you be also working with people that are also deaf? Yes. Deaf and blind yes. and with a guide dog. Yep. So, that has to be a challenge. It's a big challenge, big challenge yeah. challenge, right. Yeah. Um, and, and again, communication is a challenge. Uh, our, mm -hmm. our special needs department um, understand and, and communicate with a deaf person via ASL. So they're fluent in uh, American Sign Language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that I think is one of the biggest challenges. Right. Yeah. So when you when you look back at all the people that you've helped, um, are there some special stories about individuals that may have just, you know, just kind of made your day or right. whatever? I think. Um, I'm sure all of them do. I'm exactly sure all right. Of them do. Everybody who comes to us has a has a life story, and every story is important. Um, but when we were talking about. Um, uh, working with somebody who's d deaf and blind, I was interviewing a deaf blind uh, gentleman, John, um, a number of years ago, and he very much wanted a dog, but his environment was not safe for a dog. He lived primarily on a 
a highway. So there was oh, really right. no place. It was not safe for sighted people to walk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I had to, I had to tell them that, um, you know, this is just not a safe environment. I think you'd be very good with a, uh, working with a guide dog, but it can't happen here. And um, a few months later, he contacted us again. And he said, I've moved. Oh, okay. So he was so dedicated right. and so motivated that he picked up and he moved to a place where he could actually work with a guide dog. And I think he's right. on his third guide dog right now. Oh my goodness, um, wow. It's always, wow. you know, it was working with uh, somebody who's taking, had, finishing their first workout with a dog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not uncommon to have great emotion being expressed. I, I haven't walked this way in years. Mm -hmm. And often mm -hmm. it wouldn't be not uncommon for somebody to cry out of joy. Right. That, or right. the first time they cross a street with a sufficiency. Yeah, independence, yeah. right? Independence. And, right. and right. really beginning to understand the opportunities and the potential of working with a guide dog and um, what a guide dog can bring to somebody's mm -hmm. life. Right. And there was one person at, who told me, you know, working with a guide dog is as close as I can come to taking a walk and daydreaming. Because oh, when you're traveling right, with right. a cane, and some of the things we take mm -hmm, for granted, mm -hmm, right? right? So yeah. when you're traveling with a cane, it takes a lot of concentration because mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the cane will identify an object. Mm -hmm. it could be a garbage can in your path or whatever, but you've got to figure out how to get around it. Right. Whereas the dog will size that up, and you may not even know. And so you're just following with all of this, right. the guide, you're just, you're holding, as an individual, yeah. you're just holding on to yeah. that, and, and you, you just feel, follow the dog. That's why the dog has to do the right thing. That's right. right. So you can feel right. what the dog is telling you. You move with the dog. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, that always stuck with me, you know, that, that one statement. Right. We just, we don't always know about things until we've had the experience or we're really close to somebody right. Right. that is going through that. That's right. And uh, you learn, you learn so much about it, but it's amazing what our dogs have been able to do to right. help people. And I know in Albany, you know, we have, we have those days when people are up on legislation on uh, some of the disability issues and sure. you'll see people in wheelchairs, you'll see people yes. with dogs. And um, I mean, it's wonderful to talk with everybody in our offices right. about their needs and sensitize us and, to what's and happening. And to really, in a way, experience the wonderful things the dog can bring to a person, right? Right. Whether it's a, a service dog, a guide dog, a hearing dog. Um, and it's, it's, it's a relationship that develops between the dog and the handler that's very deep. Right. Right. It's a Absolutely. Very, very. Absolutely. Well, Kathy, you were wonderful to tell us about the Guiding Eyes for the Blind program in Yorktown. And it's been my pleasure. Yes. Thank and, you for having us. And Drifter has just been such a <laughs> such a pleasure. Uh, he certainly <laughs> has. Right. He's he's really just a really sweet boy. He's been great. Yeah, so yeah. people want to volunteer. We encourage them. Right. There's a phone number and uh, or information that they can go right. on our website. Or if, if people want to see how they can help us, if they can help us financially, they can certainly um, right. contribute. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's a been pleasure. a pleasure. And thank you all for watching. If you have any questions, just give me a call at my office, 914-941-1111. Thanks so much. Have a good evening.